Hello everyone. In this lecture, I would make an attempt to introduce you to the elegance of the Gauss law. The Gauss law is uh, something that we obtain from first principles using the Coulomb's law and the superposition principle and uh, it gives us some tremendous insights into the nature of fields that we observe in our daily lives. So now, uh, to, in, to obtain the Gauss law, uh, we need to in get introduced to the concept of the electric flux. The flux is uh, basically a quantity which is very helpful in uh, expressing a relationship between the electric field and its sources, which are the charges. So let us now consider some kind of a uh, closed surface, an arbitrary closed surface. Now uh, please note that this surface, uh, does, this does not have to be a real surface, it can be an any imaginary surface. So let us say I have some uh, uh, arbitrary closed surface which is immersed inside an electric field which is represented by these electric field lines. Now what we do is we divide this uh, surface, this closed surface, we divide its surface into many small patches. Okay. Now uh, when I say small patches, how small should they be? They should be so small that the surface of a patch is uh, practically flat. So if I take any one surface, its surface should be almost flat. That's the first thing. Second thing is that the electric field over uh, any patch, it does not vary much. Okay? The electric field more or less remains constant over any particular patch. So if we look at any one of these patches, we realize that any patch has got any arbitrary patch has got a definite magnitude. That means this has got a definite area. When I say magnitude, I mean an area. It has got some definite area. Secondly, it has got a definite orientation. Right? For instance, if I take this patch, it is oriented this way. It is uh, pointing in the upward direction. This patch is pointing towards the right side. This point, this patch is pointing somewhere between right and downwards. So a, every patch has got a certain a definite area and it has got a definite direction. So the moment we have magnitude and we have direction, so what comes to our mind is a vector. So maybe we can, it's best if we represent these areas in terms of vectors. So we represent each of these as a vector. So let's say I have any patch, let's say patch number i, that i at patch will be represented by a vector ai and this vector ai is going to describe the area of the patch and it is going to describe its orientation. Uh, the orientation can be represented by means of a vector, a unit vector which is uh, directed perpendicular to the surface. So uh, the direction of that uh, unit vector, which is or which is called uh, called as a normal vector, that normal vector is going to tell us in which direction the uh, patch is oriented. So one thing to note here is this uh, area vector that uh, we have at every patch. It does not depend on the shape of the patch. Right? For instance, you see there is this looks like an oval shaped patch. Right? This looks like a, this is a quadrilateral. This lo almo looks almost like a rectangle. So it does not really depend on the shape of the patch. It only depends on the magnitude of the area and it depends on the orientation of that particular patch. So let us take one of these patches. Uh, this is uh, an arbitrary patch, the ith patch. Let's say that uh, the electric field on this ith patch. Okay, the patch number i, the electric field is Ei and the area vector is Ai and the angle between the electric field and the area vector is theta i. Then this scalar product, the dot, dot, the dot product between the electric field and the area vector that is Ei dot Ai which is equal to Ei into Ai into cos of, cos of theta i. This scalar product, this dot product is known as the electric flux through this particular patch. That's all. Okay, so electric flux is simply the dot product of the field with the area vector. So that's the electric flux. So now uh, this one thing to note here is that this definition of flux is applicable to any vector field, need not be just electric field. So for instance, if I have, uh, let's say a magnetic field, a magnetic field which is crossing some area, then that, then if I take the dot product of the magnetic field with the area vector, it gives us me a magnetic flux. Or if I take some other example, let's say I have some uh, liquid which is flowing and I take an imaginary patch which uh, through which the liquid uh, passes by, 
with a certain velocity so it means we are inside a velocity field then i could take the velocity dot product of the velocity with the area uh, with the area vector of that patch that is going to give me the velocity flux so this definition is applicable to any vector field need not be only the electric field so now what we do is uh, now of course if uh, you all know that uh, scalar field okay if you take the sorry uh, vector field if i take the dot product of uh, two vectors it gives me a scalar so this dot product is going to give me a scalar quantity and because we have a number of patches for each and every patch we will get one such dot product that means one such scalar so this patch will have a scalar this patch will have a scalar this patch will have a scalar so what we do is we add up all these scalar quantities okay so we sum up over uh, the flux over all the patches okay gives this gives us the total flux through the entire closed surface okay the total electric flux through the entire closed surface and this electric flux can be written as the summation of ei dot ai okay uh, there's a small mistake here there should be a summation here please read this as a summation so summation over ei summation over i ei ai cos of theta i so now if i make these patches infinitesimally small then i'll be increasing the number of patches then in that case in that limit this uh, summation it turns into a surface integral the summation is going to become an integral and uh, we are considering a closed surface so it's going to become a closed loop integral so the flux through a closed surface is equal to the closed loop integral of e dot ta so what we have done here is to find the flux we have uh, uh, computed the surface integral of the electric field over the surface of the uh, um, the closed over the closed surface so if you want to find out the surface integral of in general for any any vector field need not be electric field then these are the four steps that we follow first step is we divide the surface into small patches each has uh, uh, represented by an area vector ai at each patch we uh, at each patch i find out the this uh, scalar product fi dot ai and then we take the sum over of uh, sum of all these scalar products over all the entire closed surface and then the limit of the sum as the size of the patches becomes smaller and smaller that becomes the surface integral so this is exactly what we have done to find out the electric flux so in general for any vector field you just find out the surface integral that gives us the flux of that vector field so now this brings us to the gauss law so uh, what we have here is we have uh, there is a we have here is a prescription for finding out the flux for any vector field so now what what do we need if you want to find out the flux first of all we need some field right we need some field second of all we need some surface that's all so we need these two things so that's our checklist okay so the uh, so we uh, to find the electric flux we first of all we need the electric field and second of all we need a arbitrary and imaginary uh, an arbitrary imaginary surface so let's take the simplest possible case here and what's the simplest possible case the simplest possible case is the electric field which is produced by a point charge so i have a point charge q over here and this point charge is produces an electric field and this electric field is uh, 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 this is the electric field that we consider over here because we need an electric field and a closed surface and what is the surface that we are going to consider we consider a spherical surface which is centered at the charge okay so a sphere of uh, um, radius r a sphere a sphere of radius r which is centered at the charge q okay uh, I, I should be showing a q here this, the, that's this point it represents the charge q so now at any point on the surface of the sphere so now what, what are we going to do we are just going to follow these steps what it says we divide s into small patches so imagine as if we have divided into small small patches so this is one of the patches okay so at in over this patch we first realize what is the electric field the electric field is given as one given by 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q by r square that means the electric field is inversely proportional to the square of the uh, radial distance so the radial distance is same at all points on the surface the radial distance is r so the electric field is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught q by r square and the direction that is the magnitude of the electric field and the direction is along the radial direction so this is what is given by the coulomb's law so the electric field is along the radial direction next uh, because it's a sphere because it's a sphere uh, the normal to the surface at any point of and uh, at any point on the surface of the sphere is also going to be along the radial direction so if i consider as a patch like this on this patch the electric field is along the radial direction the area vector is also along the radial direction so therefore what is the total flux through the sphere 
So the total flux, we just uh, use this integral. We have to integrate over the sphere of E dot dA. Now E is over here. We write this down. So E is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square into R cap. And what is D, dA? dA is uh, the um, area vector over here. And what is that area vector? The direction of the area vector is R cap and the magnitude is simply dA. So we have R cap dot uh, R cap into dA. So we, are t we have to basically take the dot product of these two. Now notice R cap dot R cap is going to give us 1 and everything else here it's a constant 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square because Q the charge is constant is the same so charge is not changing so everything else and the radius of this sphere is also constant so all this entire all these quantities there they are constant so they will come outside the integral so 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught Q by R square and what is left behind in the integral is this dA okay like I mentioned R cap dot R cap is going to give us 1 so it is going it is dA so if you look at it what are you trying to do here we are trying to integrate the total surface of a sphere this, we are basically find, trying to find out the surface area of a sphere and surface area of a sphere we know is equal to 4 pi R square so this integral is going to evaluate to 4 pi R square now immediately we see that this 4 pi gets cancelled as well as this R square so what is left behind is phi is equal to q by epsilon naught okay so this is the total flux due to this point charge over this spherical surface so one thing that immediately strikes us is to note that this flux is independent of the size of the sphere because you see uh, what is going to uh, what is the parameter which determines the size of the sphere it is this radius r so r is the only quantity which is going to determine the size of the sphere if it's a small if r is small it's a smaller sphere if it's r is large it's a larger sphere and this flux it does not contain this uh, quantity r okay so phi is independent of the size of the sphere so total flux over the spherical surface is this so now what we do is we take another scenario okay so far so far so good this was a very simple case we had a uh, spherical surface now what we do is we take a uh, arbitrary surface okay an arbitrary surface any any in general any arbitrarily shaped surface which contains this uh, this spherical surface so we have an inner surface which is a sphere and an outer surface which is arbitrary okay and we will try to find out the flux through this arbitrary surface okay so what i'm going to what i'm claiming here is the flux through this arbitrary surface is the same as the flux through this spherical surface which is q by epsilon naught so if you try, try to find out the flux through this surface that will also turn out to be q by epsilon naught that's what we, we have to prove here so what we do is we imagine a solid angle so we have a, sol a, sm a solid angle over here and this uh, this solid angle it radiates from this point charge q and this solid angle it is going to cut a small uh, patch of area on the sphere the small patch of area is represented by this area vector small a okay and this of course this distance is small r now the same solid angle it is also going to cut cut another patch on the outer surface okay it is going to cut uh, a patch uh, which is represented by this area vector capital a okay now please note that because this uh, outer surface is arbitrary it need not be this surface this patch need not be perpendicular to the radial direction it can be in any random direction so the orientation of this surface with respect to the uh, radial direction okay it is represented by this angle theta so now uh, i can uh, easily find out what is the uh, this outer the area of this uh, uh, patch on the outer surface with respect to the area of the patch on the inner surface okay so this area the, uh, i'm just talking about the magnitude here the magnitude of this area is small a and the magnitude of this area is uh, capital a so this ratio capital a by small a it is going to depend on it's going to give, depend on these two factors first factor is capital r square by small r square where do we get this capital r square by small r square we get this from the fact that the area it varies uh, uh, directly it is directly proportional to the square of the distance okay so here uh, at small a the distance is small r at capital a here the distance is capital r so this capital a is directly proportional to capital r square and small a is directly proportional to small r square so capital a by small a it will give us a factor of capital r square by small r square and where does this factor of 1 by cos theta come from that again comes because like i mentioned that the orientation this area the orientation this uh, a, a, a patch of area a it need not be oriented perpendicular to the radial direction it could be at an angle 
and larger this angle the more will be the area so that it cover it spans the same solid angle okay and this gives us this factor of 1 by cos theta so from here we get the area of this uh, outer patch to be equal to r capital r square by small r square into a by cos theta again the uh, from uh, coulomb's law we know that the electric field is inversely proportional to the square of the radial distance so on the inner patch the radial distance is small r so the electric field here which is e small r the electric field on the inner sphere, uh, inner patch is e small r this e small r, r is inversely proportional to small r square and the electric field over this patch which is e capital r it is going to be inversely proportional to uh, capital r square so if i take this ratio capital e r uh, e capital r by e small r that is going to be equal to small r square by capital r square so this gives us e capital r that is the electric field on the outer patch to be equal to small r square by capital r square into the electric field on the inner patch so these are the two results that we got this is the relative uh, size size of this uh, area with respect to this and the relative electric field the uh, the magni uh, magni uh, relative magnitude of the electric field here with respect to the electric field at this point so now uh, what is the electric flux through the inner patch that is very straightforward the electric flux through the inner patch will simply be er into a that's because as we saw the electric field and the uh, area vector they are parallel to each other so er e small r dot a is simply going to be er into a okay because these two vectors they are parallel to each other so their magnitudes will simply get multiplied now what about the electric flux through the outer patch the electric flux through the outer patch is going to be equal to the dot product of the electric field which is passing through this okay dotted with the this area vector that is capital a so e capital e capital r dot a which is going to be equal to e capital r into capital a into cos of the angle between the two now what we do is we just substitute over here e r e capital r is basically this which we place over here and uh, capital a is this which we replace over here and there is a co this cos theta comes from here so now you can see here this small r square and this small r square gets cancelled this capital r square and this capital r square gets cancelled and this cos theta and this cos theta gets cancelled which gives us er into a which is the same as the electric uh, flux through the inner patch so this tells us the flux the flux through this outer patch and the flux through this inner patch they are going to be exactly identical so in a similar way we can uh, get, obtain a correspondence between uh, outer patch elsewhere also okay if you take any uh, other uh, other direction okay which is radiating from here we could have an inner patch and an outer patch and we am um, uh, using this correspondence we can show that the flux through any surface here will equal to the flux through a corresponding surface on the outer patch and then when i add over all the surface it will tell us that the total flux through this outer surface will be equal to the total flux due to this inner surface okay so what is the conclusion that we draw we saw that here the total the electric flux is independent of the size of the sphere not only is it independent of the size of the sphere it is independent of the shape of the surface also so electric flux through any arbitrary surface okay which encloses a point charge and is, it is equal to simply q by epsilon naught so all that matters is the charge which is inside so q by epsilon naught that is going to give us the electric flux so now uh, this uh, what about a charge which is outside okay so this is we have considered a charge lying inside the surface how about if the charge is outside the surface in that case the flux uh, through that closed surface if the charge lies outside it is going to be zero we can easily prove this let's consider the case where the charge q is outside the closed surface s okay we have to show that the flux through this closed surface s is going to be zero to prove that there are many ways there are actually many ways by which you can do that one way is by using that solid angle te technique uh, which we had uh, done so which we had used we, uh, just just now uh, but there is another way by which you could do that much more interesting way by which you can do that is if we imagine okay that there is another closed surface which encloses this q okay that closed surface which encloses this uh, point charge q let's call this as s prime 
and this closed surface and in the, this closed surface s prime and this uh, existing already existing surface s we bring them so close that their surfaces they touch and there is a small neck which is produced here and through this neck okay, as you can see here because of the small opening between s prime and s we get a total surface which is going to be uh, which is going to be a closed surface so that surface we call it as s naught okay so s naught is basically uh, the this uh, surface which is already here this closed surface plus this uh, extra um, uh, construction that we have done here we have imagined another surface s prime so this s prime plus this s will give us this new surface which we call as s naught which is also closed okay and because it is closed because s naught is closed and we just saw that uh, it the all that matters is the surface be closed okay the flux through any closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed divided by epsilon naught so because s naught is closed because s naught is closed the flux through s naught which we I, I write it as phi naught that flux will be simply equal to q divided by epsilon naught so the total flux due to this surface s naught is equal to q by epsilon naught now if let's say uh, this uh, flux and uh, this phi naught is the total flux through s naught okay let us say the flux through s prime is phi prime and the flux through s is phi then the total flux that we have written over here phi naught it will be equal to the flux through this surface plus the flux through this surface okay so phi naught is equal to phi prime plus phi so now if we make this small neck which connects these two surfaces if we make it smaller and smaller and smaller then what is going to happen is this s prime is going to become uh, is going to uh, tend towards a closed surface okay which encloses this charge q and this s is going to uh, tend towards a closed surface which does not contain this charge q and we know that uh, if a surface uh, encloses a, a charge a closed surface if it encloses a charge then the flux through that closed surface is going to be equal to q by epsilon naught so because in this limit as the neck becomes smaller and smaller and smaller s prime is going to enclose this charge q so therefore the flux through s prime is going to tend towards q by epsilon naught and we know that phi naught is equal to phi prime plus phi over here phi prime is tending to q by epsilon naught and phi naught is already it has to be it should be equal to q by epsilon naught because this is the overall closed surface so we are having q by epsilon naught is equal to something plus something this first quantity is tending towards this value which means the second quantity it should tend towards zero so the flux through this is going to tend towards zero as this neck becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and finally when this neck it breaks and we get two surfaces the flux through this outer surface is going to be zero okay so if a close if a surface does not enclose a point charge the total electric flux through that surface is all going to be always equal to zero so having uh, seen both the cases once where the charge is inside and another time when the charge is outside now we can we know that we can disregard all the charges which lie outside and consider only the charges which lie inside so let's say i have a number of charges q1 q2 q3 and so on n number of charges which lie in the interior of a closed surface so you can guess what i'm going to do here i'm just going to use the go ahead and use the superposition principle okay so the electric field it follows the superposition principle so therefore if i take any patch here imagine a small patch over here at any patch the electric field through this patch will be due to the superposition of the electric field due to q1 the electric field due to q2 the electric field due to q3 and so on the electric field due to q n that uh, uh, vector sum of all these electric fields that is going to give us the total electric field at this point now if you remember when we you know, talked about flux we did not really say what kind of flux the flux due to is it the flux due to a point charge is it due to a uh, and the charge distribution is it due to a discrete charge distribution or a continuous charge distribution nothing was told we just said that there is some electric flux so the definition of the electric flux is uh, independent of the nature of the charges which produces that flux okay so we are only interested in the total electric field which is produced at any one of these patches and that total electric field will be by superposition principle it will be this total vector sum which can be of course written as the summation of eis which is the electric field due to the ith charge so what is going to be the total flux through this surface s that will be the uh, the closed loop integration of e 
dot d a. Now, what is this e? This e is this summation. Okay, so integration of this summation dot d a. Now, this integration and this summation they are independent of each other because the summation is taken over the charges inside and the integration is taken over the surface. This surface area and the number of charges inside they are independent of each other. So it really does not matter whether you first perform the summation and then integration or first integration and then summation. So we might as well take the summation outside. So I take the summation outside, take the integration inside and what we have is the, uh, the surface integral of EI dot dA. That is the surface integral that we have. And we immediately recognize this. What is this? This is basically the flux. The flux due to what? The flux due to the ith charge. So this is which we call as phi i. So the total flux through this surface is equal to the flux due to the first charge plus the flux due to the second charge plus the flux due to the third charge and so on. That is going to give us the total flux. And as just now we saw because uh, the, uh, where, where this phi i is produced by what? It is produced by uh, uh, electric charge. Uh, point, uh, point electric charge is going to give a give a flux which is equal to q by epsilon naught. So what is phi i? Phi i is going to be simply equal to q i by epsilon naught. So q i by epsilon naught. So summation q i by epsilon naught that is going to be the total flux through this surface S. So I can take this one this one by epsilon naught outside. So we get phi is equal to one by epsilon naught summation of q i. So what is this? This is the total sum of all the charges that are lying inside. Okay, so this uh, leads us finally to the Gauss law. So from here, what we see here is the flux is equal to one by epsilon naught. This summation is the total charge. So now again, like I said, that the flux is independent of the flux is simply e dot uh, e dot t a, right? At any patch, so it is independent of what has produced that electric field. So whether it's a discrete charge distribution or it's a continuous charge distribution, that does not really matter. So I might as well replace this summation QI with maybe some kind of an integral in case it's a continuous charge distribution. So this gives us the Gauss law, the Gauss law which states that the flux of the electric field through any closed surface, which is the, the, the surface integral or that is this one over the surface is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times the total charge which is enclosed by the surface. So this electric flux is equal to 1 by epsilon naught times the total charge which is enclosed. So we can write the total charge enclosed as a summation like this in case it is a discrete distribution or we could write this total charge as a, a volume integral of the charge density. So that is your Gauss law. Okay. Now uh, this uh, ha, um, uh, this le leaves us with the questions as uh, what is the whole point of this? Uh, having uh, learned about Gauss law, what is the point of the Gauss law, or uh, where does it take us from here? Okay, so uh, if you look back uh, at the derivation of the Gauss law, we realize that the Gauss law, uh, uh, in deriving the Gauss law, we have used uh, two uh, ideas. One is that uh, the electric field it follows an inverse square law nature and that is from the Coulomb's law. That is the first idea. The second idea is that the electric field is additive. If I have many different charges, the electric field will be simply the vector sum of all of these uh, in the electric fields due to each of these charges. That is uh, from the superposition principle. So these are the two ideas that we have used in the derivation of the Gauss law. So it uh, gives us an idea that the Gauss law need not uh, be applicable only to the electric field. The Gauss law can be applied to any uh, inverse square field which also uh, satisfies the superposition principle. Okay? So any inverse square law field which also, satisfy, which, uh, which also follows the superposition principle, the Gauss law is applicable. And the example that immediately comes into mind is gravity. So we could actually have some kind of a Gauss law for gravity also. Okay. All we need to do is we just need we can derive it in uh, in uh, explicitly using uh, the using first principles. Okay, in mechanics, or we could just use the Gauss law that we have just derived and find out what are the equivalent quantities and just obtain it directly like this. So, in case of gravity, what are the equivalent quantities? First, electric field. What is electric field in case of gravity? Electric field is nothing but, uh, the, in, in case of gravity, gravitational field is nothing but the uh, gravitational acceleration. So E is uh, equivalent to gravitational acceleration. Next, the constant 1 by epsilon naught. That will be equivalent to 4 pi g. Okay, so now how do we get 4 pi g? If you take this 4 pi onto the other side, we get on the left hand side, we get 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught. 
and if you if you compare the uh, newton's law of gravitation with the coulomb's law the constant okay the constant in both of these laws in, in newton's law of gravitation the constant is the universal gravitational constant g in case of coulomb's law the constant is 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught okay so 1 by 4 pi epsilon naught is corres it corresponds to g here so if i multiply both sides by 4 pi we will get 1 by epsilon naught 1 by epsilon naught will then correspond to 4 pi g so wherever we have 1 by epsilon naught we will have to replace it with 4 pi g and thirdly the, the total charge that we have the total charge we will have we it is equivalent to minus m now where does this minus m come from okay now if you remember any charge if i don't specify the 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 sign of the charge okay we always assume it to be positive okay so the difference between these are two different properties of matter okay mass and charge these are two different properties of matter but the main the fundamental difference between these two charges is while mass is only of one type mass can only be positive but charge it can be positive as well as negative okay and this uh, uh, dual nature of the charge it it it, uh, it uh, i should not be using dual nature i should say bipolar character of the electric charge it leads us to the force the electric force being either attractive or repulsive unlike gravity okay which is always attractive gravity is always attractive but the electric field okay it uh, the force due to the electric field it could be attractive or it could be repulsive so if i have a positive charge the electric field will be always pointing in the outward direction so electric field will be pointing in the outward direction if it's a positive charge if it's a negative charge the electric field will be pointing uh, in the inward direction but whereas in case of gravity okay the mass is always positive so the force is always attractive so the field the gravitational field will be always pointing towards the masses so look at the equivalence i have a mass the field the gravitational field is always pointing towards the mass i have a charge the electric field will point towards the charge only if the charge is negative so that gives us that minus sign over here so now when you uh, you know make the substitutions this suggests that the gauss law of gravity could be something like this okay instead of e dot da surface integral of e dot da we have surface integral of g dot da which is equal to instead of 1 by epsilon naught we have 4 pi g and instead of q n close we have minus m so surface integral of g is equal to minus 4 pi 4 pi g into m enclosed so this is the gauss law for gravity now uh, the gauss law again uh, further insights if you'd like the gauss law it extends our knowledge in uh, mainly two ways firstly it is the converse of the coulomb's law when it comes to the connection between the field and its sources in this way okay the coulomb's law if you just uh, you know look at look at the coulomb's at the bare bo bare bones of the coulomb's coulomb's law what exactly does the coulomb's law do what does the coulomb's law do it uh, basically if you know the charges we can use the coulomb's law to determine the electric field okay so knowing the charges the coulomb's law determines the electric field but the gauss law is the converse of the coulomb's law okay in Gauss law, if you know the electric field, you can determine the charges. Knowing the electric field, the Gauss law determines the charges. Okay, so in that way, the Gauss law is the inverse of the or the converse of the Coulomb's law. Then, secondly, the Gauss law is a powerful analytic tool. Okay, uh, it gives us a way to uh, suppose in some uh, in specific distributions there happens to be some kind of a symmetry of the charge distribution. Then the Gauss law it gives us a very powerful way to utilize this symmetry and calculate the electric field very very easily. Okay, in fact that is what we are going to do next. Okay, so this brings me to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture we will uh, explore this uh, second point in uh, more detail. We will see how we can use the Gauss law to utilize or to exploit the symmetry of certain charge distribution and easily evaluate easily calculate the electric field which otherwise if you use the coulomb which you try to use suppose you try to use the coulomb's law to do do so that becomes a very very involved process but using gauss law it becomes really really straightforward just a few in a few steps we'll be able to easily find out the electric field not in all cases but only in those cases where the charge distribution has some kind of a symmetry okay so with this i come to the end of this lecture so these are some of the references that uh, i have used in this lecture Thank you.